but the things that they should be doing, they are doing, but their clan is not giving them the feedback that's right. That can be very frustrating for all involved. A relationship between a clarinetist and their repair technician is a really, really important and sometimes very special thing. Uh, here in New York City, there's been a number of repairmen that have come and gone. Uh, one of my very favorites is here to talk to us today. Got some questions. We're going to learn about a blown out clarinet. What does that mean? Is it a thing? Is it because you blow too hard? All these questions will be answered. And she's going to talk about a lot of other things because she knows about clarinet. Her name is Melanie Wong. Here she is. I don't see Melanie very often. This is a real treat for me. Welcome, Miss Melanie Wong. Hey. To the clarinet ninja world. Um, I've been perusing the Facebook groups, as I, as I do, uh, the clarinet group specifically. And I saw a conversation that I wanted you to help us work out a little bit what it means. I, I saw a long conversation with many perspectives on what it means to have a blown out clarinet. Can you, can you help us? To determine what that means? Yes. So a clarinet, whether or not a clarinet blows out is a super hot topic among clarinetists. Um, a lot of people are like, no, it never happens. A lot of people think like, yes, of course it happens. I can tell you my perspective is that yes, it absolutely can be blown out. Um, the conventional wisdom around it is that usually like after years and years of swabbing, what you've done is smooth out the bore to the point that the sound properties of the instrument have, have changed. Um, and so what that really, the effect of that is that um, over time, the, the twelfths of the instrument, so the tuning of the instrument gets much more spread. And this is always a problem that we have on clarinet, like from the beginning, but you know, over time, it just becomes more and more egregious. Um, and then also the secondary thing is that the clarinet won't project as well over time. And so when you're trying to blow a super loud forte, like no matter what you do, sometimes you'll feel like it just completely plateaus and like you just can't get louder. And if you're playing in some sort of orchestra or something, you know, your conductor may be asking you to get louder, more clarinet, more clarinet. And you're like, I just can't do it. You start to, you know, try to compensate all sorts of things in your mouth, your throat, try to change your mouthpiece, change your reeds, whatever. Um, but actually, it's just the clarinet being blown out. And it usually happens over a really long period of time. Um, a lot of people want to know, like, how long, how much does an instrument need to be played before it blows out? And there's no, like, one, you know, specific time frame that it happens in. But it's usually, like, if you were, for instance, like a professional clarinetist in a giant professional orchestra playing every single day um, very vigorously, it like could be anywhere from like six to 12 years is is the average. If the clarinet is not being played at that <clears throat> professional level, it can last much, much longer. Okay, so I always imagined, and you know me, I've got an active imagination, that somehow or another the, yes. boar, the boar was warping. Is that part of it or is that not actually a thing? It's, yeah, so like it does, it does change. Um, so it does, you know, you have to think of the wood like, yes, it's dead because it's been cut down, but the what wood um, always is expanding and contracting. And as like a woodwind instrument, we are constantly blowing super hot air into the instrument and creating tons of condensation down the bore. And so it's just expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting. And then on top of it, you're swabbing or you should be swabbing um, and you are literally just like smoothing it out. You're like very lightly polishing it every single time you're running that swab through. Um, that's another reason why people really like, uh, or a lot of professionals will recommend like silk swabs because they're, the, even though they're maybe not as absorbent as some of the microfiber ones, they're kind of doing, they're the least abrasive, right? And so they're uh, changing the bore like, you know, less than something something more abrasive. Um, but but yeah, so the bore does, it. the bore just changes. And so that's, it's all part of it. Okay, so what you said just triggered another question. It's a kind of a bonus question for a video about blown out clarinets. And here it is. I swab my clarinet putting the weight in the bell and pulling it through that way. And I know a lot of other people <laughs> will say that that's idiotic and, and one should swab the other direction. And I'm curious to know, as a repair professional, what's the right answer? Yes, please, please, please swab top down, barrel to bell, <laughs> start in the top. And the main reason why is because um, 
it's much less likely that the swab is going to get stuck on the register tube. If you've ever had a swab stuck in your upper joint, it is always caught on the register tube, um, which if you've never looked inside your clarinet, the register tube um, protrudes into the bore and is just this like giant metal piece like sticking out. And that's what the swab gets wrapped around. And it is so much easier for you to get the swab out if it did somehow get wrapped around from the top than from the bottom when the entirety of the swab is like mostly in the clarinet and all jumbled up. Interesting, because I I am an idiot, I guess, because I, I was swabbing it that way, <laughs> believing that it was less likely to get stuck in the clarinet. That's not right. No, no, yeah. Because ideally, like, you know, you want the most amount of swab out of the instrument when it gets stuck. And because the register tube is up at the top, Okay. if it's going to get stuck, you know, yeah, makes sense. Okay. Yes. Th that makes sense. Now, now, what about this yes. as a theory? This is not my theory. This is something that I, <laughs> I heard somewhere that, that if you swab, <laughs> I'm just trying to get my position to be right. But if you swab from, from the barrel down, you're, you're actually, uh, over time, wearing out the the top of the the barrel by having the 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 swab pull against that. Yeah, again, I'm, I mean, uh, sure, okay. sure, but like at the same time, you know, so this is going to be super, super like minute. You know what you're pulling through, just like we were talking about how it's you know the silk swab is like less abrasive. So it's like yes, you are technically wearing it out, but no really no more like it's it's still going to be so minute in comparison to if you've ever had you know and i've i've had so many very famous professional clarinetists like calling me up very last minute like i'm about to perform and i my swab is stuck can you please help me right now i can't get it out right like so that at the end of the day is um I think is it's worse. <laughs> it's a worse trade off well, than because it doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, whew, you're in trouble. <laughs> uh, a, a tangent to a tangent. Uh, Twenty years ago, I was playing uh, Strike Six, second clarinet, and the, the the principal clarinet, who I won't mention who it is, was swabbing, <laughs> and, I, and, and I don't remember what direction he was swabbing. Uh, right in the third movement, right before bum 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 bum. Swab stuck in the clarinet. Stuck. Yes. And I was trying to I was trying to give him my clarinet, but he wouldn't take it. Because <laughs> he's like convinced if you can just pull it out, you can get it. You can get it. But and, 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 and then this person is now a, a principal clarinet player of a major orchestra. I'll have you know. So that, that limits it to a number of people. I believe it. We, we, we can guess who it is. But 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 here is the magical part about it. He got it out. And then nailed the solo with that extra adrenaline. He somehow still managed to keep it together and and, and play the solo. It was amazing. All right. So now, oh my gosh. so I, I've got, I've got. Let's say I've got an old an old clarinet. I'm trying to determine like, is this blown out? How how would I know if I if I'd been playing that clarinet for twenty years? And then and let's say I'm playing recreationally. Mm -hmm. I'm playing I'm playing it for twenty years. What are some indicators that I can like sort of check? Like, because it's like, I'm imagining, at least for me, like I, I've had clients for a long time where they're getting to the end of their life and I, you know, I've been playing it for so long and it's been changing so gradually. I can't, I can't even tell that it's changing. Can you give us any tips on, mm -hmm. on what to look for or feel or how to deal with it? Yeah. Yes. So a lot of it comes down to knowing the clarinet, knowing what the instrument was like when you bought it, right? Knowing where the tuning was, was kind of lying and where you know, just in general, how you were feeling, like you were able to project, you were able to, you know, you weren't having those types of problems. And then over time, you might start to realize, you know, and first of all, you've kept the instrument in good working condition. You take it to a repair te technician often, and you know that it's sealing, you know, it's not just leaking or cracked or something else is going on. Right. But then you still just find yourself like, you know, like, why can't I project? Why can't I ever find a good read? Or like, why am I so out of tune? You're suddenly having to do all sorts of weird stuff with like tuning rings or finding different barrels. You're just messing with your setup all the time. It's a good time to go kind of check out, you know, some other clarinets. Like even if you can go get to a showroom and try some different ones or try your colleagues' clarinets, you know, and see the difference in the feel and if those things aren't a problem. Um, and a, I would say a biggest, the biggest way I see people get tripped up about their clarinet is like, 
the the thing is that if you if the clarinet is blown out, right? And people always talk about, for instance, buffets and like the the sweet, like ringing tone that they have, right? And they just fall in love with this like sweetness in the sound. Um, that'll never go away. The clarinet can be so blown out, like beyond its usable life for anyone. And it's still going to sound sweet, right? <laughs> but that's like, you know, so you have to be able to kind of look past that and attempt to to find that in a new in a new instrument again. And remember, when you do try new instruments, that the they're going to be a little bit more resistant than what whatever you currently have, um, and they're gonna they're gonna be a little bit more like stiff. They're gonna take a little bit of time to break in, and you want that, you know, you want that to be to be the case. Otherwise, it will blow out faster. Okay, so, so you know, I'm, I, I I can be dense sometimes. I just want to make sure I'm understanding and that everybody's understanding. Tone is not a way to tell if your instrument is blown out. The, no, the, not the, not yeah. like not in terms of the sweetness. You really, okay. really have right. to just pay attention to the the tuning and really that like kind of projection ability. Right. So it, it's not it's not something that's that's partic particularly tangible, right? It's it's stuff that that. Yes. Yeah, like, and so yeah, you, you couldn't put it on a chart necessarily. I mean, I guess one could, but like it, it, it really yeah it, it, yeah. It, it, there's intangibles involved. In yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and it's a feel thing. And if like if you are a professional player, or if you're an amateur player with a professional player teacher, right? Like, um, like you you would be able to tell. So like UJ, like if you have like your new, much newer clarinet, right? And then you go and play some super old one, you're gonna feel immediately like it's it's just kind of like wild and like it takes a lot to control it. You know what I mean? And you're just like, where, why is the pitch center just all over the place? You know what I mean? And why is it like weak? Cause you know what I mean? It just feels weaker. It doesn't right. feel like it has any power, power behind it. Um, but definitely if, you know, if you're a more amateur player, it can be very difficult to tell. Right. To tell on your own. Right, right. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a hypothetical situation and you obviously can't answer it very specifically. But let's say I used to play the clarinet and I took 30 years off. Now I still have my old R13 that I had in college, and I played it really well mm -hmm. at the time. And it's still sitting in the closet. I mean, obviously somebody should take it to a repair technician. I'm curious yes. to know, like particularly for people that don't live in major metropolitan areas, what would you suggest? in terms of making sure that the system that's coming out of the closet is in good repair. And can you talk a little bit about another hot topic, which is should a clarinet be oiled? And if a clarinet has been sitting there dry for 30 years, how do you, can you just start playing it like crazy or should you do something special or specific or very thoughtful in terms of getting that clarinet back into action? Yes. Yeah. People have a lot of different opinions on this, but or let's go from the from the end. Like you asked about oiling the clarinet, right? So should you oil your clarinet? That, in my opinion, uh, in my experience, really comes down to what you mean by oiling. Because if you ask different repair people, they will have vastly different ideas of what it means for the clarinet to like need to be oiled. Um, so if what you're talking about is... Um, which is very common to do and I highly recommend is putting some like sweet almond oil on a swab and running it through the bore. I think that is a wonderful idea. And yes, you should absolutely be doing that. And, you know, professional clarinets, you should be doing that anytime that your bore starts to look dry. And you know, it's looking dry because it gets, um, instead of like a, like a rich brown or like deep brown color, it starts to get literally like whitish in the, when you look inside of it, it looks like kind of ashy. Um, and that is, it's really, you know, I liken it to putting lotion on your skin that gets dry in the winter. That's just like what that is. And that can definitely help prevent cracks. Um, and I say it helps. It will not, it's not like a cure-all that will definitely prevent all cracks, but it, it certainly helps. Um, if you are talking to somebody and they're talking about like a deep oil, like heated submersion thing where the clarinet's going to be oiled for like weeks. I don't recommend that for instruments that are even up to like 30, 40 years old, um, even a little bit older, they, they likely don't need it. It's, it's very extreme when it, when an instrument would need something, something like that. And the reason is, you know, that kind of process, like the instrument would have gone through 
something similar at the factory, like during its manufacturing process. And it's just, usually it's just going to kind of clog up the pores and, and deaden the sound because it's, that's just too much. That's more than, than the instrument needs. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm bringing my clarinet back after 30 years, go to the closet, yes. I get it out. What should I do? Should I immediately try and find someone to repair it? And for those people that don't have someone like you, although uh, Melanie's given me approval to say she's retired from uh, repairing clarinets, uh, you know, I I, I won't uh, embarrass Melanie with too many compliments, but she has changed careers into one that makes more money, still has creativity and allows her much more time for her family. And I'm all for that, except for she doesn't repair my clarinets anymore, unless I go visit my mom in Arizona and ask very, very nicely. Right. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, if somebody doesn't, if somebody doesn't have access to one of the the, the top repairmen in the country, what should you do? I mean, because you, you want this clarinet to still work, it's unlikely, at least in my estimation, that you're going to get it out and the pads are all going to seal and it's going to function. Like it seems like you would have to do something to it and have somebody look at it if you're going to try and play it. Right. So th there's that. And is there a way like that you can talk a little bit about what you want to try and find in a repairman? Like if if somebody lives in a, in a, in a small town and the only instrument repair shop is a, a shop that repairs band instruments for kids. Mm -hmm. How do you decide whether that's the right person to look at this instrument, like a, like a 30 year old R13 that's coming out of retirement? So first of all, I'll say, well, you know, what should you do when you get it out? I mean, there's no harm in like just trying to play it in that right. moment and see what happens. Um, and usually, depending on the types of pads that were in there and how long it's been and how how dry the conditions where it was kept, like a lot of times it's not necessarily the pads themselves that don't quite seal. A lot of times it's that the key work might be binding, um, like they may be very stiff and like not really want to move. Stuff may be being held open, like pads may be held open um, just because the key can't snap back down. Um, that, that happens a lot. And so if it, I mean, if it doesn't play notes, it, yeah, you got to take it into to somebody that can help get, get it to play notes. Um, there is no harm in doing what I talked about with the oil yourself. Like if you, all you have to do is, um, get some sweet almond oil from, from your like local grocery store, put a little bit on a swab. Ideally, this is like not your everyday swab. This is like you just get a swab that you you use because now it's going to be all oily. Um, and then you just pull it through from the top <laughs> and you just pull it through the inside <laughs> um, and it, you can kind of like swirl it around a little bit and then, you know, pulled it up to the light and look at it and you'll see if you missed some spots with the oil because it'll be like very shiny um, or it'll be very dry in some spots. Um, and you can do that in the upper joint, the lower joint. You can put a little bit in the bell, in the barrel. You know, you can put it a little bit in the sockets and that will just help it. If your clarinet happens to work out of out of the closet 30 years later, I wouldn't recommend immediately just playing it for like four hours. Your mouth probably can't do that after 30 years anyway, but if somehow, you know, you have like superhuman mouth mouth muscles, like, you know, I, I don't recommend, I do recommend breaking, kind of breaking it in a little bit. Not as rigorous as like a brand new clarinet, but you know, that piece of wood is very contracted. It hasn't been played in a long time. And as soon as you play it, you're expanding it. And so you just don't want to do that too intensely, too quickly. Otherwise you can kind of like force a crack. This won't surprise you. I've got a system for oil. I, I've always oiled my clarinet. And, yes. and particularly when I was using the sort of bore, bore oil that you would say not to use, like the ones that, you know, say bore oil they on sell them. as bore oil. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I have my swab in a Ziploc bag. And the other thing that I do is I wear a shirt that I don't care about because I'm going to get oil all over me, right? I, I go to the kitchen where yes. I, I, I can, you know, I don't do it. I don't do it on anything that I don't, I can't wipe the oil off of because it's going to be there for yes. a while, right? Because yes. it, it doesn't really, mm -hmm. it, 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 it uh, doesn't really go away. Yes. Yeah. So I, I've got my boar oil and shirt, you know, so, so like it's, it's a mess. I don't wear it anywhere else other than, yeah. other than the oil my clarinet. I wonder, like, if somebody has, like, a very special clarinet to them, an old R13, let's say, and they go to a, a shop that, that specializes in kids' band, you know, for kids' band instruments. Yes. Is it possible yes. that, that, that a person, even a well-meaning person, a person who's trying really hard, 
who just doesn't have that much experience with those instruments, can they damage the instruments if they get their hands on them in that situation? Is there a risk in this? Sometimes, sometimes it depends. Um, it's, it's really just so dependent on, on the person um, that's working on the instrument. If it is, you know, I would just ask the repair person about their qualifications. You know, did they go to repair school or did they apprentice? Do they specialize in woodwind instruments or in brass instruments, right? Because if this is really a, you know, mainly a brass person that really just kind of handles a few plastic clarinets every school season, you know, hopefully they're very honest with you about this and are not going to do more than they're comfortable, but you can't always guarantee that, right? On the other hand, if it's a person who is, you know, maybe themselves a clarinet player or an oboe player or something like this, right, where they're used to, they have their own professional instrument. Yes, maybe they're working primarily on student instruments because that's just the place they work in, but, you know, they they do handle at least their own instrument and maybe probably their friend's instruments, you know, that kind of person, like, they're probably going to have a, a good enough handle on it that they're not going to, like, severely damage the instrument. You know, if they don't, if they aren't great at handling professional instruments. Some people don't know how to take care of the wood. Something actually that happened to me when I was in college is I took it to a person like this and they put my instrument on a lathe in order to do the tenon quirks and they split it right open because they were used to being able to tighten it down really hard for a plastic instrument, but this is wood and we can't tighten it that much. And they just literally split my clarinet right open. Um, and so that was very like, you don't want that. So you want somebody who has some knowledge of, of dealing with, with wood instruments. Right. We, we were talking about this before we started rolling. Uh, you know, I know that certain uh, certain of my favorite technicians, and I get confused as to which one told me what, because I I, I think I'm a good customer. And, and I, 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 I think I chit chat the exact right amount most of the time, sometimes a little too much. But in any case, uh, that some people and we're not going to say who, won't work on instruments older than a certain amount mm -hmm. of years. And, and so that that yes. is something to consider when you are starting to play again after a long period of time and you have a very old instrument. There are, I mean, if you live in a place or decide to send your instrument to somebody, there are people who will happily, you know, work on that instrument and there are people that won't. And I think that that's something, like, yes. like in dealing with people that repair instruments at the highest level, like it's just like anything else where it's a very specific group of people that have strong opinions. And also one of the things that I, I figured out a long time ago, the best repairmen in the country, repair technicians, because you know, I don't want to make that gendered, uh, they don't need us. <laughs> like you have enough, everybody that, that repairs clarinets really well has enough clarinets to repair. They don't actually want that many more. Right, and, and so I, I th that's something for for those people that that are are coming back and they've got a professional clarinet that's that's very very old. That's something to keep in mind is that there is a way that the clarinet repair world might interface with you in a weird way because there's standards and ideas and things that aren't completely obvious to somebody who doesn't know. And you know, after spending hours in repair shops and dealing with people. And getting an understanding is one of the things that happens in New York, and which I think is one of the reasons why Melanie left New York. Probably not me specifically, but people that come in with their instruments and want it fixed right now and want to talk to you while you do it, right? <laughs> which I certainly was one of those people. But <laughs> but but you you learn a lot about what what they like and what they don't like. And one of the, the real important things is mm -hmm. we need you more than you need any individual one of us. And and that's that's something yes. that that's important to keep in mind when if if somebody is looking to get uh, an instrument repaired by a top level technician, and I don't want to make it sound like you have to play by their rules. That sounds very ad adversarial, and I don't think any of you are adversarial. Well, that's not true, but most most <laughs> are not. <laughs> and and uh, and and it, and it's you, got, you have to sort of like test the waters and see, see you know if, if you know recognize you're in a situation that is there every day for them and not your every day for you. And it's, it's, a, it's a thing to navigate. I think that we, I mean, we've learned a couple of things. We've learned about blown out old clarinets and that that might be a problem or it might not be a problem. Like you, it sounds like somebody could play for, recreationally for fun, not in a professional environment on a blown out clarinet and it would be fine. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, 
I mean, like, I think where it becomes difficult, you know, from a, from a, on the teacher end of it is that somebody might have intonation problems that aren't actually them. And if, and if you're trying to teach somebody who has an intonation problem on their clarinet, but the things that they should be doing, they are doing, but their clarinet's not giving them the feedback that's right. That can be very frustrating for all involved. Exactly. Right. But that's exactly the time where, you know, for this student, right, it's, it is time for them, right? right? If they're getting that serious or playing in some sort of environment where like, you know, or they really want to improve to that level, those types of, you know, standards, then yeah, that the blown out clarinet, it's, it's really going to be time for them to upgrade. That's one of those rare moments when a repair technician will say, no, that's not you. Because most of the time we come in hoping that you're going to make us a better player by making our instrument work better. And oftentimes yes. that's, that's true because, you know, like there's things wrong that you don't know that they're wrong. And so there is that incremental improvement when you go see somebody that sets it up just right. But most yes. of the time, the real problems are us. But with a blown out clarinet, with pitch, mm -hmm. it, it may not be you and there may not really be anything that you can do to, to solve yeah. that. And I think that if you've been playing it for a long time, that can really impact how one is approaching the clarinet and how they're playing. It can get into some weird habits. So, but, yes. but, but by And it can make it harder to switch to a new clarinet right. because nothing else, nothing compares or might things on a new clarinet, my, a newer clarinet might seem really off because you've actually learned all of these weird things that you're doing with your body and your air, you know, to compensate for this, for this older, older right. instrument that is really just past its time. So, so we, we got that covered. You've taught me how to swab. I appreciate that. We've talked about oil and we covered a lot here, Melanie. Thank you for doing this. I've got some other yeah, ideas. Will, will, will you come back for another video sometime soon? Of course. Okay. 